Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. Your webinar is about to begin. Please use the volume controls on your computer or phone to adjust the sound for this presentation. Good day and welcome everybody to Obesity Canada's webinar series. Today's presentation is Redefining Obesity, How Childhood Experiences Influence Obesity. My name is Nicole and I will be hosting today's webinar. This public webinar series is an exciting opportunity for Obesity Canada to interact with Canadians to disseminate credible and evidence-based information about obesity. Through this platform, experts will weigh in in obesity, bias, and discrimination, prevention, treatment, policy, and more. If you'd like to be a part of our public community and want to be the first to hear about future webinars, please become a member at obesitycanada.ca and opt in for our newsletter. An archive of this webinar will be posted and available for viewing on the obesitycanada.ca forward slash webinars page. Due to the extremely high volume of requests to join this presentation, we have disabled microphone and question and answer features. However, we do want to answer any questions you may have. So if you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, you may do so via social media or in the evaluation survey at the end of this presentation. Now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Sheila McDonald is a research scientist in maternal child health and acting director in the Department of Research and Innovation, Population, Public and Indigenous Health at Alberta Health Services. She is also an adjunct associate professor in the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary and the lead scientist of the All Our Families Albertan Pregnancy Cohort. Dr. McDonald's research program focuses on influence of early adversity on trajectory of health and development and the risk of resilience factors for child development. And Dr. Laura McDonald is a medical officer of health in the Calgary Zone and of Alberta Health Services and on the Provincial Injury Prevention Steering Committee responsible for domestic violence prevention. She is a member of the Diabetes, Obesity and Network Strategy Clinical Network, the Chronic Disease, Disease Prevention Coordinating Committee and the Alberta ACEs Task Force. She is also a clinical associate professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences, Cummings School of Medicine and a member of the O'Brien Institute of Public Health. Her work on ACEs was was inspired by learning of the connection of ACEs to obesity and domestic violence and the need for public health to look further upstream in its prevention of work. I will pass the presentation along to Dr. McLeod and Dr. McDonald. Hello everyone. We're very pleased to be able to talk to you today. I want to make sure you know we have no conflicts of interest. We're both just paid by Alberta Health Services. And a bit of an outline of what we're going to be doing today. We're talking about what are the ACEs, how they're related to obesity, and then what can be done about them. I just want to make a caution to people that this discussion can be triggering for those of you who have a history of trauma. Please feel free to take a break if you need to. The webinar will be posted and can be accessed later with the ability to pause when needed if you want to take a break. What is an ACE? Adverse childhood experiences, which we summarize as the ACEs, include all types of experiences of abuse, neglect, and dysfunction that occur to individuals under the age of 18. Mental illness, incarceration, and substance abuse refer to those conditions in the parent, caregiver, or other close household member. Divorce is a marker for parental abandonment. Exposure to domestic violence Exposure to domestic violence counts, even if the child didn't witness the violence, as the family tension contributes to the child's stress. The ACEs score is one point for each of these categories of experiences, not for how many times each abuse happened. So the scores will range from 0 to 10. We know, however, that the more frequent the abuse, the greater the trauma that occurs. As you can see, the ACEs score doesn't cover all types of childhood trauma. There are other forms of adverse experiences, including bullying and broader social stressors we consider adverse community environments, another ACE, such as poverty, racism, discrimination, 
poor housing, community violence, or disruption. These are often referred to as a plus in the score, for example, a score of 10 plus. As well, there are many traumatic experiences that occur to adults, but for this presentation, we are focusing on childhood trauma as it has a special influence on brain development. Where did all this work come from? The Centers for Disease Control, in collaboration with one of the largest health maintenance organizations in the United States, Kaiser Permanente, conducted the first study that linked ACEs to health consequences later in life. In the mid-1990s, over 17,000 individuals undergoing physical examinations at the Kaiser Permanente HMO completed a confidential survey about childhood trauma and their current health. Participants in this study were educated, employed, middle-class Americans with an average age of 57 years, not an underserved population. This landmark study found relationships between the number of childhood traumatic experiences and poor health and well-being later in life. Higher ACEs scores were linked to chronic diseases, mental health and addictions issues, and early death. Interestingly, the ACE study developed from a weight loss trial where Dr. Folletti noticed that following weight loss, some individuals began to quickly gain back their weight. We will discuss this more in the obesity part of the presentation. There's now a large body of evidence that shows a stepwise relationship between the number of ACEs and poor health outcomes, health behaviors, and loss of life potential. Scores of zero to two show little health impact, but effects increase at three and up. The higher the score, the more severe the impact. There are over 40 health outcomes that show this increasing effect with increasing ACE score, what we call a dose-response relationship. Seeing this recurring pattern across many different health problems is powerful evidence of the importance of the relationship of ACEs to health and illness. This slide shows a summary of what Drs. Folletti and Anda found in their study. A number of investigations in different countries and across diverse populations have produced similar findings. There's a strong link between early trauma and poor health outcomes later in life. The health effects as seen here include physical diseases, unhealthy behaviors, mental illness, and effects on pregnancy. This figure shows more details on the results of Folletti and Anda's original study. They compared individuals experiencing four or more ACEs compared to those who had no ACEs, and they adjusted the data to be sure to rule out effects of age, gender, race, and educational attainment. We see here that what are called odds ratios, a measure of increased likelihood, for a variety of outcomes range from 1.3 1.3 at the bottom of the table for sedentary activity, so people who aren't active, to a high of 10 or 12 from drug use and suicide attempts. The darker bars at the top are disease conditions, which can be two to four times more likely with the higher ACE scores. Obesity is listed here as a risk factor, not a disease, because this work was done in the 1990s before obesity was recognized as a disease. Severe obesity is 1.6 times more likely in persons with an ACE score of 4 or more than in a person with a score of 0. The risk goes up with increasing ACE scores, as you will see in later slides. Why are we talking about childhood experiences? Developing brains need building blocks of good nutrition, love, shelter, and stimulation in what are called serve and return interactions, kind of like a tennis game. For example, when an infant or young child babbles, gestures, or cries, and an adult responds appropriately with eye contact, words, or a hug, nerve connections are built and strengthened in the child's brain that support the development of communication and social skills. You may have heard about the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative of the Palix Foundation. Their work is to translate existing evidence on brain science and mobilize information on toxic stress, adverse childhood experiences, and outcomes. Their insight is that lifelong health is determined by more than just our genes. Early life experiences change our brains in ways that make us more or less vulnerable 
to health problems in adulthood. Together with the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, these organizations are working internationally to share common messages about brain development. How is it that ACEs can cause changes in the brain and other health systems? There are three types of stress responses, positive, tolerable, and toxic. A positive stress response is a very brief activation of the stress response and quick recovery. Examples would be taking a test. There is a brief increase in heart rate and only mild elevations in the stress hormone levels. All resolve very quickly. Tolerable stress is a time-limited experience of stress and one recovers from it from, through buffering factors like supportive relationships. Examples would include the loss of a loved one or a natural disaster. Toxic stress is different. Here the stressor is chronic or intense and causes prolonged activation of the stress response in the body, which leads to physiological changes. Specifically, ACEs lead to neurobiological changes, and these changes arise in part due to an overwhelmed stress response system, including excessive physiological reactions, altered stress hormone levels, reduced immune function, and increased inflammation. Over time, Individuals with toxic stress display a different neurobiological profile from those who have not experienced such adversity as children. Imagine being hypervigilant, watching for a threat all the time. You can feel how that would affect your health. This overview of the mechanisms of toxic stress on health shows that there are also underlying protective factors and genetic and genetic vulnerabilities that moderate the stress response and account for individual differences in response to similar stress. It's important to note that these protective factors can prevent or minimize the development of toxic stress and its consequences. We will discuss these protective factors later when we talk about resilience. The predisposed vulnerability is referring to genetic risks. You can see that toxic stress influences the neuro endocrine and immune systems with clinical effects such as pregnancy problems, inflammatory diseases like asthma, arthritis and bowel diseases, heart attacks and strokes, as well as mental illness and addictions. Obesity is an outcome of the endocrine metabolic and behavioral changes. Because obesity is a separate risk factor for many of these other diseases, the relationship with ACEs is of particular importance for Obesity Canada. Epigenetics refers to the impact of environmental influences on our genetic material, DNA. Toxic stress can cause parts of the DNA to unwind and expose genes that were previously hidden. This change of which genes are switched on and off can change our cells' structures and functions and can be transmitted to the next generation. Knowing this is both concerning and compelling. Here is some proof of the relationship to the brain changes with toxic stress. Extensive research on the biology of stress now shows that toxic stress can have damaging effects on learning and behavior. These are two PET scans showing changes to brain architecture and function. On the left, we see one of a child who has not experienced abuse and neglect, so a healthy brain. And on the other scan, is a child who was institutionalized in a Romanian orphanage shortly after birth, extreme deprivation in infancy, so an abused brain. Note the red and yellow colors show the most brain activity, and blue and black are the least active. What's called the temporal lobes, the circled areas on the right brain, regulate emotions and receive input from the senses. And these are nearly dormant in the child who experienced extreme deprivation in infancy. This is a worst case scenario for neglect, but shows clearly that brains are damaged structurally and functionally by toxic stress. The ACE pyramid illustrates this conceptual framework and the brain research helps us understand the mechanism. Toxic stress from trauma in childhood leads to changes in the brain. 
exposure to trauma influences the stress response, which leads to unhealthy coping strategies, leading to health and social problems in adulthood. Brain changes increase both direct and indirect risk for health problems. The direct risk are the sort of straightforward biological pathways we've been talking about, altered functioning in the nervous, endocrine, and immune systems, which increase the risk for developing chronic diseases. The indirect risks are via impaired social, cognitive, and emotional functioning and maladaptive coping behaviors which threaten health. The good news, notice that it's a pyramid, not a rectangle. Not everyone with high ACEs will develop all these consequences we have been discussing. The difference lies mostly in the protective factors or resilience, which we'll talk about soon. An ACEs survey done in Alberta by Dr. McDonald, my co-presenter. It was conducted in 2013 by a random digit telephone dialing and found that 56% of Alberta adults had experienced at least one ACE over 10% had experienced four or more. These, the results sh also showed a graded relationship with perceived health and diagnosed health outcomes, similar to the landmark study we've been talking about, with the tipping point being at least three ACEs. 20% of Albertans had three or more ACEs, and we expect national figures would be similar. So one in five of the general population have had enough trauma in childhood to affect their health as adults. This graph is the mirror image of the one you've just seen. It was done at the Boyle Macaulay Health Center in Edmonton, who surveyed their population, who are a more street-involved population with addictions and a high proportion of Indigenous patients. This this graph illustrates that not all populations have the curve you just saw. In some subpopulations, the scores are dramatically higher. When adverse childhood experiences are experienced in adverse community environments, characterized by violence, racism, or poverty, for example, the effects are compounded and often lead to multi-generational stress and poor health outcomes. When there's a higher prevalence of poverty, unemployment, and food insecurity, this indicates higher levels of social vulnerability and lower levels of community resilience. The work of building community resilience is to build networks that foster resilience against the stressors that can become toxic to a child's development and long-term health. We're now gonna talk about the relationship of all this to obesity. As I mentioned earlier, the original landmark study came from a weight loss trial. Dr. Folletti noticed that following weight loss, some individuals began to quickly gain back the weight they'd lost. One woman had lost 300 pounds, but quickly regained 100. When interviewing her to try and understand what was going on, he mistakenly asked what her weight was when she had first had sex instead of his standard question of how old she was at that time. She replied, 40 pounds. He thought he must have made a mistake, and he repeated the question, and she again said 40 pounds, started to cry, and told him her father had sexually abused her from the age of four. Paletti then asked all of his patients who had regained their lost weight, or some portion of their lost weight, and of the 286 patients, over half had experienced sexual abuse as a child. Many of them reported feeling threatened by sexual attention as they lost weight, so they regained the weight to deflect that attention. Paletti then teamed up with Dr. Anda from CDC to then do that bigger ACEs study about those effects on health related to adverse trauma in childhood, as we talked about. Uh, the mechanisms that Folletti cited linking ACEs and obesity were, as we mentioned, that weight could be an armor to protect someone from unwanted sexual attention, and also that it could provide temporary for relief from the anxiety and depression related to their histories of abuse. Hi, everyone. 
Thank you, Laura, for introducing the topic. And I'm going to talk now about the evidence and also strategies to mitigate risk and build resilience. So there is a growing body of evidence linking ACEs to both childhood and adult obesity. Samples include clinical patients undergoing bariatric surgery or on the wait list, and the general population presenting at physician offices or surveyed via local or national annual data collection ways. And most of the, there is most consistent evidence for a history of sexual abuse. But we also see evidence for associations with the additional ACEs, such as emotional and physical abuse. Relationships are dose response, which means that as the severity of abuse increases or more types of abuse are experienced, the risk for obesity also increases in both child and adult samples. So in summary, the evidence suggests that adverse life experiences during childhood can play a major role in obesity development, potentially linked through emotional health, maladaptive coping, stress, inflammation, and metabolic disturbances. So here, this graph here is an example from one study that examined the association between ACEs and obesity in a pediatric population. So the figure compares the proportion of a particular ACE among normal weight children, overweight children, and obese children. And as you can see, the proportion of each ACE is higher among obese and overweight children compared to those within the normal range of BMI in a dose response manner. Let's just look at an example. For domestic violence, right in the middle there, there's a higher proportion reporting this ACE among obese children at around 13% compared to normal weight children at around 8%. And here is an example from one study that examined the association between ACEs and obesity in an adult population. Obesity was defined as a BMI of 30 or more. And the figure shows that there's a positive correlation or association between ACE severity and obesity. That is, as ACE severity increases, the prevalence of obesity also increases. So this graph actually is flipped a bit from the previous slide. We are looking here at the proportion of obesity versus the proportion of a particular ACE, which was on the previous slide. But in both cases, the interpretation is the same, that there is an association between ACEs and increased BMI. This slide speaks to an Edmonton-based study similar to the 1998 ACEs study by Dr. Felitti and Anda. More than 20% of 500 people asked in an obesity clinic patient population reported sexual abuse. And the Edmonton Adult Bariatric Specialty Clinic is one of five bariatric treatment centers in Alberta. It is staffed with both psychologists and psychiatrists. They offer psychological treatment of obesity that focuses on adverse childhood events, and past trauma. Everyone treated at the clinic is assessed for adverse childhood events as part of routine intake. Now we're gonna talk about what can be done about ACEs. You might be thinking that as adults, the harm is already done. But as adults, understanding the links between early life experiences and health outcomes and health behaviors can be an intervention. This can lead to changes that prevent further harm and rehabilitate harm that has already happened. Also as adults, there's the intergenerational piece, supporting adults such that the cycle of adversity can be stopped and therefore risk is mitigated for the next generation. The other side of the coin is resilience. It is very important to note that ACEs are not deterministic. Although we cannot eliminate the ACEs once they have occurred, we can reduce the burden by helping individuals optimize their positive supports and build their resilience skills. And ideally, of course, we need to aim for prevention. Negative experiences can be balanced by positive supports. Think of the scale where a person's good and bad experiences get stacked over the course of development. Positive experiences that get stacked on one end are called protective factors and include things like attentive caregivers and available social supports that provide things like good prenatal health, nutrition, healthcare, and a childhood rich in serve and return interactions. The 
the other end of the scale gets loaded up with bad experiences, what scientists call risk factors. And these are experiences that cause toxic stress and tip the scale in a negative direction. Toxic stress occurs when no caring adults are present to buffer the effects of experiences such as abuse, neglect, or parental addiction. So what works? Evidence so far indicates robust evidence suggesting cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based interventions that are effective for youth and adults with a history of ACEs because they target modifiable protective factors such as emotional regulation, thoughts and behaviors, interpersonal relationships, and supports. Even five minutes a day of mindfulness has been shown to be helpful in adolescents with high ACE scores. It doesn't have to be a psychiatrist referral for everyone. Second, trauma-informed care is a strength-based service delivery approach and evidence-based practice that is grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma. It emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety, and it creates opportunities to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. In terms of prevention, the Harvard Center for the Developing Child highlights three principles to optimize early childhood development based on over five decades of research on early childhood development interventions and programs. And these are supporting responsive relationships for children and adults, strengthening core life skills, and reducing sources of significant stress in the lives of children, families, and adults. So in trauma-informed care, the intervention is a caring and curious response. Trauma-informed practice skills build on skills we already have as healthcare providers listening, compassion, empathy, and validation. Rather than asking the question, something is wrong with you, it is changed to something has happened to you. Now I'm gonna talk a bit more about resilience. ACEs go hand in hand with resilience. We cannot just talk about ACEs in a vacuum since we know there are strategies and supports that mitigate risk in the face of adversity and ACEs are not deterministic. So many of the next few slides focus on prevention and building resilience for children and youth, but many of the concepts relate to adulthood as well. So as mentioned on the previous slide and knowing what we do about ACEs and brain architecture, we must work to change the conversation from what's wrong with you to what happened to you and how can we help? For children, the presence of compassionate adults, including teachers, caring coaches, or other adult mentors can help build resilience. And adults dealing with other adults affected by ACEs need to show empathy in their interactions. Taking a public health approach is another strategy. Our work to build resiliency can't be concentrated on an at-risk population. But instead, we need to consider the entire population at risk. So this is a very upstream and multidisciplinary approach to affect the kinds of change necessary to build the skills of resilience on a scale larger than the individual. Connections between researchers, frontline staff, community partners, etc. The presence of caring adults in stable environments are a necessary component for a child's healthy development and for building resilience. Safe, stable, nurturing relationships between children and their parents or caregivers act as a buffer against the effects of toxic stress and ACEs. And in fact, research is now showing that the presence of supportive relationships is more critical than the absence of ACEs in promoting well-being. And if parents are struggling, other adults, like teachers or coaches, can be present to provide the safety, stability, nurturing relationships that children and youth need. We can also invest in supports and promote policies that strengthen families and set them up for future success. And for adults, strong support networks and empathetic relationships also help to create a culture of compassion and understanding, which is necessary for healing. To create good outcomes for children, we need to support adults. Understanding ACEs for adults help decrease the risk 
of continuing the cycle of risk. And finally, science is showing that the effects of ACEs are not permanent, and we need to put to bed forever the sense that children who are born under disadvantages, disadvantaged circumstances are doomed to poor life outcomes. Science is saying that's not true. For adults, getting help and support via cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, and skill building in emotional regulation may help individuals feel more comfortable in their bodies, increase their confidence, and psychological and behavioral components can be modified, even if neurobiological changes due to toxic stress have already occurred. So what can you do? In this webinar, you might have become more concerned about your health and how your experiences have affected your health. And with further general resources, but this link goes directly to the SCORE questionnaires if you want to take them. Be sure to test your resilience score as well as an ACE score. If you are a parent with a high ACEs score, you'll want to access resources to help you parent more effectively and decrease the risk of passing your ACEs on to your children. Sometimes just learning of the relationship of childhood trauma and your current health conditions is the key to improving your health. Often talking to a supportive person is all you need. As Dr. McDonald mentioned, mindfulness has been shown to help, sometimes even just five minutes a day. You could try a meditation phone app or yoga or other ways of just calming your mind when you're feeling stressed. Some people may need more and can benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy. Ask your doctor about how to access this. Referral systems may vary from province to province. In talking to your doctor, they may not be familiar with ACEs scores. If not, Ask them about prevention of other chronic disease and, as mentioned, potential referral to psychological resources. Individual advocacy, I think, is important for all of us. Dr. Folletti says, tell everyone. The more people who know about ACEs and understand their impact on obesity and other chronic health conditions, the more likely it is that weight stigma will decrease and also that others may learn about their own ACEs issues and get help for those. Considerations for your network. Can't just leave it up to the individuals. <laughs> Some primary care physicians in Alberta are screening. Do you think all family physicians should be? What about pre-bariatric surgery? Would it be helpful? Some studies have shown an increase in suicides after bariatric surgery, particularly in those with pre-existing mental health problems. Would ACEs screening help at-risk people get help prior to surgery? and decrease their suicide risk? More research in this area would be helpful. Obesity Canada already advocates for decreasing weight bias. A better understanding of ACEs and resilience and their links to obesity should further help to decrease stigma. Public education and universal education can be powerful mechanisms to help create a culture of compassion. The network could also advocate for further research in how to incorporate ACEs assessments into obesity care and advocate for trauma-informed care throughout health services. This last slide on resources, uh, we've put in a couple we think you would find helpful. ACEs Too High is one that's addressed to the public. And as I mentioned, the screening questionnaires are on the site along with a lot of other information. The Alberta Family Wellness Initiative has numerous videos and other resources on the brain story Child Development and ACEs. There's a free Brain Story Certification course online on their website that's recommended for people working in health, but some of you might be interested in it even if you don't work in health. The Centers for Disease Control website is aimed at professionals and the public and has again a wealth of information about this. We're happy to answer your Twitter or Facebook questions about this material and thank you very much for your interest. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar for today. 
Thank you, Dr. Sheila McDonald and Laura McLeod for sharing this information, and thank you to all of those for taking the time to join today. For those of you that use social media, you can tweet us using hashtag obesity talk, send us a message on Facebook, or click on the survey box in the window on your screen and complete the survey. You may disconnect and close your browser now. We hope you have a great day.